Hey Previews World and welcome to the panel, a monthly book show where we pick out a book, we give you time to read it, and then have you join us at a panel of guests as we have a little chat going in-depth into the comic. And to give you a little info on the book for this month, we have Torma from Third Eye Comics. Hey Previews World, this is Third Eye Torma here from Third Eye Comics and we're going to talk about one of the all-time greats, Batman Hush. Thanks, Torma. And now that we're back in the studio, I want to go ahead and introduce our esteemed panel of guests. First off, we've got Carrie Wood, who is the writer of the Overstreet Price Guide to Batman. Then we've got Dan Poole, who is a filmmaker and Viz Media associate. And right next to me, we've got Steve Anderson, owner of Third Eye Comics in Annapolis. Thank you guys for joining me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah of course. Absolutely. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so quick background on the comic book itself. So Batman Hush ran uh, in October of 2002 through September of 2003 from DC Comics. It was actually voted as one of the top 10 Batman stories of all time. Uh, and they actually, in July, they produced a animated series, or animated movie, which starred Jason O'Mara as Batman, Jerry O'Connell as Superman, Jennifer Morrison as Catwoman, and Rebecca Romaine as Lois Lane. So, let's get into the discussion. Overall, what are your quick takes? What did you guys think of Batman Hush? I'd say it's top 10. Uh, top 10 in terms of like defining stories. Um, if you want to hand somebody a Batman story and say, this is what you read, Hush is on that list. Yeah. Which, which is how I came into it. I was never a big Batman reader, but somebody said you gotta try it, so I checked it out. and it, it hit all the points, you know, everybody made an appearance, and uh, it, was, it was cool, it was a lot of fun to read. And that's kind of the way that I started off, because, you know, for me, I'm not a big, like, Batman know-it-all. I, I kind of know the movies and a little bit. Um, so coming into comics, I kind of get nervous about, I won't know the characters, and, and this book did a really great job of introducing, you know, all the good guys, the villains, and kind of setting it all in, in place for someone who's never really started off reading Batman. Right. But to get deeper into the discussion, let's go ahead and get focused on the art. So, a little introduction on Jim Lee. Jim Lee is currently the chief creative officer of DC Comics. His first breakthrough title was X-Men number one, which is still the best-selling comic book of all time. And was used as the design for the animated series, which is one of my all-time favorites. Um, he was also a co-founder of Image Comics before returning to art at DC, where he worked on Hush and continued his success with the New 52 and more. So, just a little brief update on Jim. It's hard to condense Jim Lee into three sentences. Yeah, because yeah. he has Quite such a, career. a huge Legend. history. Not even getting into his actual physical, I mean, <laughs> I was going to say natural relationship with Stanley. It was a bad joke. Sorry, everyone at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We like the Sorry. joke. All right. And with that, let's go ahead and get started talking about the art. All right, guys. So what was your impression of Jim Lee's art for this series? It's iconic. I mean, when you look at the art from Hush and you look at all the merchandising they've done for Hush over the years, that image of Batman on their gargoyle, you know, like that image of Batman and Catwoman, and not just like the Batman, but like, you know, the stuff that he did with all the, the villains, like that's what a generation of comic readers know as the rogues. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's great. It's, it's incredible. Um, I, I do think it is iconic. I think the fact that there continues to be merchandise put out for Hush, um, I mean, more than 15 years yeah. later at this point, um, it, it really does go to show the sort of longevity of it. Um, my big sort of beef with the art here is um, all of the women look the same. Um, Jim Lee has like one female body that he uses for all of the female characters. So like Catwoman looks exactly the same as Huntress, looks exactly the same as Poison Ivy. Um, looks exactly the same as Harley. They're just, you know, maybe wearing different clothes and have different masks on, but like their face is very similar and their body type is exactly the same across the board. And that drives me nuts. <laughs> he um, does it so well. He, he does do it well. Like he does that one body type yeah. very well. Um, it's also not great when um, Bruce and, and Clark look the same. Uh, there's a panel late where they're talking to each other in the Batcave and um, Batman has his, his mask off. And like there's two profiles of both of them and they look the same. And there's supposed to be two different people talking to each other. But like if you took that those panels out of context, you would not be able to tell that those are two entirely different characters talking to each other. Um, so that sort of 
drives me nuts. Um, and I, I think that that's very indicative of the time. Um, I feel like comics in general were sort of doing that throughout the 90s and into the, the early 2000s. But um, yeah, it's like it's it's certainly good art, but it's it's art that's very 2003. It's I very think. like stereotypical kind of you know superhero type bodies mm -hmm. that you kind of just see. Where like like you say, like nowadays there's more I guess body acceptance, and you know you have characters of all shapes and sizes, there's and so far more body diversity. Yeah, in exactly. Today. So that's a good point. I never noticed that. Either. Yeah, um, I I think you you have the hourglass women and you have the Dorito men. And <laughs> the Dorito, I like that. <laughs> and uh, that's very prevalent in this book. For me, being a being a Marvel guy, my whole life, um, <clears throat> I have every issue that Jim Lee did of X Men. Big fan. I mean, he's one of the best. And uh, when I dove into this, the first, um, I'm a big Spidey guy, right? McFarlane is just he's the man uh, for me. The first full page um, art piece in this thing is Batman on his uh, his rope. Very spidey, yeah. <laughs> right. Very. Sp I've never seen Batman like get into right. this McFarlane pose. So that grabbed me right away. And whether I thought it was derivative or not, I was in. I'm like, all right, what else you got? <laughs> I think. I think with the art, the thing about it is, is um, Hush is one of those stories that's like um, the best DC stories are kind of like like a Greek myth. You know what I mean? It's like an iconic story. You know, that's the difference between them and Marvel. Is you know, Marvel's more about the people. DC's more about the the mask. You know what I mean? And with Hush, you know, like you have, it's very archetypal, like, arch, I don't know how to say it, but you know what I'm trying to <laughs> yeah. say. It's very much archetypes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and I think, I think he captures that perfectly because when you look at it, it's like Hush's Arkham Asylum, the video game, you know, Hush is like everything that's kind of the template for what we've seen for Batman. And it's splashy and stuff. It's not my favorite art, like on a personal level, but like for like the importance of the book, I think it like captures that like perfectly, like in that regard. Yeah. Steve, do you yeah. have any examples of your favorite art? I mean, I like somewhere? Paul Pope's Batman. Maybe like, <laughs> on your, yeah, you hold your arms up. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, but yeah, I mean, like, like, I mean, like, but yeah, it's just it's it's the kind of Batman, just like Jose Garcia Lopez, like that was like the Batman of the '80s. I feel like this is the Batman of the modern age. You know, I I do think. Um, D despite my hang-ups on like the the lack of body diversity here, there are some like details that I really enjoy in here. Um, mostly, I love the way that the art subtly changes when there's a flashback yeah. happening, um, and that's a lot through the use of color because um, Jim Lee um, did all the pencils here. But uh, I'm going to check and see who the colorist was because I can't remember off the top of my head. Scott Williams inked it, and Alex Sinclair was the colorist. So. Um, and and the the inks also help convey this sort of like dreamy flashback sort of sequence, um, particularly really cool. when he's he's thinking back to his childhood with Tommy, and he's thinking back to um, when he was working with Jason Todd and whatnot. So it takes on this sort of dreamy ethereal quality um, that really makes it pop out from the rest of the book. And I thought that was super cool. Um, I also really love the use of color in the graveyard fight yeah. against. Yeah. Jason Todd, or who he thought was Jason Todd, at least, um, with all this like bold red and whatnot, that really makes it stand out from the entire rest of the story. Oh yeah, well, I mean, because it's a very, I mean, it's a dark story, so it's a very dark comic. You know, same same with you. It's not my particular art style. It's a little bit grittier than I would normally go for, but I, it works for the story right, exactly. because of what the the subject matter is the kind of it actually lends to that kind of like tense feeling and yeah. and he really shows that kind of movement in the artwork with like the fighting scenes it's very graphic it's very you know it, it drives it i mean his yeah. action stuff i mean there's um there's some books i heard that don't have um that had some uh Publishing issues and the text isn't all there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe maybe you've experienced this, but uh, it didn't matter. Yeah, because Jim Lee's artwork just drove it, and I watched each panel, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. I yeah. get it. You, you just see he tells the story visually. Period. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and the character designs are great. I mean, his Killer Croc. I think people are still using that Killer Croc. Oh, it's fabulous. You know, like that's they haven't done a different design since that. You yeah. know, yeah. Did he ever get fixed? 
I feel bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Killer Croc I thought was really cool. Um, I loved the Riddler in yeah. this. Um, the, the Riddler design, like very much drawing on some classics while while still keeping it yeah. um, modern, I thought was was really good. And I loved the Jason Todd design, like an yeah, it was aged really great. Jason Todd. Given that like we hadn't seen him since the mm -hmm. late 80s yeah. at this point, it was like, okay, cool, what would Jason look like? He made him if cool. He was, yeah, he made him really cool. <laughs> I thought Jason yeah. was cool beforehand. Yeah. Jason's, Jason's my favorite weapon. Um, but yeah, I like there's there's some really cool choices here as far as the villain designs especially. Yeah, no, Jason Todd, that, that was really spectacular. Yeah. I mean, for, for all we know, you know, he's dead, he comes back, now he's aged, and, and it was kind of like this look of like what could have been. Yeah. yeah. You know? So it was that kind little, of that little lick of gray hair in his <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, so that cool. was great. Yeah. And another thing about driving story through art is is how much story Jim Lee can pack into one panel. If you go back and look at some of the details he puts in that you'll maybe miss the first time through, it's really exciting to go back and see. Like, if you look close in the pupil of that kid's eye in the very beginning, the, the kid held for ransom, mm -hmm. you can see Killer Croc in his pupil getting ready to yeah. hit Batman. Then on the next panel, you see Catwoman in the very back. You might miss that, but she's in the very back. And you know she's, you know, you ultimately know she's coming to get the money. Later on, I think it's uh, uh, Joker's eyeball. You can see Harley with the hammer behind him. It's uh, so many little things that he packs into every panel. It's, it's where, where do you see that? Yeah. yeah. It's it's really lush artwork. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of detail going on. Um, just like as as you said in in the backgrounds, like he's he's filling every yeah. single panel um, as as much as it could have possibly held. And now that we've gotten a little bit of the art out of the way, let's move on to the story. All right, and a little bit of background on Jeff Loeb. He has worked on a number of Batman titles, including The Long Halloween, which was actually one of the basis for Batman Begins. He's also worked on Superman, Age of Apocalypse, and Fallen Sun, Death of Captain America. And then in filmmaking, he was actually one of the co-writers of Teen Wolf, and has also done several episodes of Lost, Smallville, and Heroes. So, let's get into the story. What did you guys think? I thought it was awesome. I mean, with Hush, I was actually working in a comic shop when that came out. And I remember the excitement when a new issue would come out of the singles where people were like, oh my God, what's next? And that's kind of what Jeff Loeb does best is these great cliffhanger, like, you know what I mean? Where you're like, is this what it is? Um, and the other thing that I think he does really well, and this is why Jim Lee was such a great choice for it, is he, he writes to his artist. So when you put Jeff Loeb on a book, whether it's Red Hulk, it's Long Halloween, uh, even Ultimatum, you know, like he writes to that artist where basically he gives them the cool stuff you want to see them draw, you know, yeah. like you want, these are all the things you want to see Jim Lee draw. And yeah, I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was perfect for what it is. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, Loeb has been one of the most successful comic writers, um, particularly of, of the last, I mean, 20 years or Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Um, for a reason, and it's because he's very good at what he does. Uh, I, I think he, he managed to really strike a, a key balance in this book because there's so many moving parts. And this is the kind of storyline where like, it, it could have very easily gotten lost um, under the amount of characters that he's trying to bring into here and whatnot. Um, but the, the core storyline, um, and even the sort of like couple of different subplots that are going on, are um, they're they're balanced in a in a really good way and in a way that remains compelling from from start to finish. Um, Hush is like it it keeps a good tempo really from from start to finish, um, whereas you know other arcs maybe sort of go up and down yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but this like hit hit its pace very early and it keeps that pace for the entire duration of the storyline. See, I didn't have the benefit of of waiting every month to. Uh to see what was happening next, so I, I binge watched it. You know, right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> with the graphic novel, so to me it was just another page, another page, another page. Uh, also, I didn't read it when it first came out, so years later I'm reading this thing, and to be honest, I kind of picked it apart a little bit, um, and maybe it's because when something's done years ago, right. people start doing it over and over, so I've seen it since then, but so this might have. Yeah. So in the very first, you know, he's chasing Catwoman and the <laughs> Hush shoots his, uh, his bat rope. Yeah. What if he'd have died? He just, <laughs> it's, you know, cracks his head, cuts that gargoyle, he's dead, done. Yeah. Yeah, we got nothing else to ink, sorry. Um, 
I was excited to see the characters come up. I didn't know all those Batman villains. I, I really didn't know who Huntress was, believe it or not. And I didn't think we would see Superman. I was like, ah, they won't go there. And then they went there. I was like, you know what? That's cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And then he fights him. I'm like, ah, this, all right. So it was, it was fun. So even I, as picking it apart, was checking out each storyline. Like, all right, that's cool. That's cool. And then um, um, another point, I had it, <laughs> <laughs> um, was that uh, I lost it. What were you going to say, Steve? Yeah. I, think, I think what you're saying about the characters speaks to the strength of Hush, and I think that's probably one of the best things about Hush. In our stores, um, for the last, since we opened, probably the last 12 years, um, it's been the book. When someone comes in and says, you know, my 12-year-old son or daughter wants to read um, Hush, or wants to read Batman, we give them Hush. Um, or someone comes in and they're like, I have, in 40 years, never read a Batman story. I just played Arkham Asylum or Arkham Origin or whatever we give them hush. And the reason why is because literally, he does this textbook kind of introduction of each character, here's everything you need to know, they look cool, and it's just, it's great. Like, hush is kind of like the pop song of like Batman comics, where like, it'll never go out of style, <laughs> like you know? Like, yeah. it's great, yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's because he brought it back to what Batman really was, because as someone who's watched all the movies and not read a lot of the comics, you kind of forget that Batman is a detective. Right. Like, it's detective comics. He asks yeah. a lot he, of questions. <laughs> yeah, he's like out there trying to basically be a superhero and a detective at yeah. the same time, and I love that they reintroduced that, like, that, or that idea, or that was introduced to me in this series, was he really wants to find out who did it, and he wants to you yeah. know, solve the case. And I love that because I hadn't really thought of him that way. I guess right. I always thought of him as like the vigilante justice. I never thought that, like the, the Superman thing where he's like thinking about in terms of like chess, like how do I beat him yes. and finding yeah. out like, what is Superman's weakness? Right. How do, like that I wouldn't have actually seen Batman doing, I guess. In a way, I, I think of him more as like just kind of brute force. Yeah. You don't see him in that thought process, but he really wrote in these these monologues mm -hmm. and, and this kind of like, what's going on in his head? He has these like finesse moments in here that um, I feel like are, have become somewhat few and far between when it comes to Batman. As you said, I feel like contemporary Batman is I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna use these fists and right. I'm gonna use my gadgets and I'm I'm, I'm gonna a punisher with more money. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, to to see Batman like actually using his brain to try and deduce like what is actually happening here um, and why is is really compelling. Um, I think to to sort of get get into some criticism. Um, not a fan of the romantic subplot happening right. here. Um, I, I think Batman and Catwoman, obviously, like, Batman and Catwoman have had this tumultuous romantic relationship that goes back to, like, the Silver Age. Like, right. this this goes back decades. And, you know, they, every so often they bring it back. Obviously, they brought it back within the last year and whatnot. Yeah. With, well, it are, are they going to get married? Like, um, so it's... It can be very compelling when it's written correctly, and there were compelling moments in here, but overall I thought the Catwoman romance subplot was one of the weaker points of the writing. Well, only at the end when they just trashed it because she said hush. Oh yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> this whole thing was predicated upon their relationship and there was a, a thread yeah. all the way yeah. through and it was brought up. He takes her to the cave, takes off his mask. Yeah. And then he go to kiss the edge, like, oh, happy ending, hush. What? You're out. I'm going. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to word. I'm like, that's it? I'm like, wow, okay. It's such a very fragile relationship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the movie where, he, well, it ain't Ozzy and Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, unlike um, anybody that says they knew the ending of The Sixth Sense, right? Right. Am I the only one that called Tommy Elliott early on? Like, why else would they bring up a, an old friend yeah. that I've never heard of before? I'm like, uh, so maybe that's me picking it apart from years. No, after. you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember when the when it concluded, and I remember the reaction to it was kind of like, okay, you know, <laughs> like a, like the ending. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that the character of Hush, honestly, like even though that's the title character, mm -hmm. I think that might have been the weakest part of the story. I think that everything else around it was yeah. the cool stuff, and the later stuff with like Paul Dini doing like Heart of Hush and all that that made Hush really cool. But like. I, I didn't think Hush was the best part of it. I thought everything surrounding Hush was. Yeah, I would yeah, agree yeah. with you. I, I think, like, Hush Hush himself, like, 
kind of a kind of a. You swing. look cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like ultimately, like yeah. k- kind of a swing and a miss. As yeah. Far as like that. Well, it kind of felt like concerned. two endings, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for Definitely. sure. At least. Yeah. yeah. And then, did we ever find out what happened with Batman's mind? Like, I mean, there I was left with some questions too. Yeah. I mean, they were just so many questions, which we can continue on in the discussions in the comments below. But now we're going to move on to some final thoughts and questions. First, we asked, have you read Batman Hush? Let us know in the comments what you thought of this modern DC classic. Dark Knight 840 says, a wonderfully balanced book. The villains aren't just stuffed in to show off the rogues gallery. The story pacing keeps the reader engaged and the undercurrent of the developing Batman-Catwoman relationship is beautifully explored. A legit modern classic. What do you guys think? We were just talking about that relationship. Uh, everyone's entitled to their opinion. <laughs> What about you guys? I think modern classic is the best way to define it um, in terms of that because that it is it is the book where if you're going to put five Batman books in an airport, Hush is one of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would say it is cer- certainly a modern classic. Yeah. Definitely. Now that it is in one book, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine reading this as one-offs. That would be, oh, I'd be like anticipating the yeah. next one so yeah. bad. Which is why Netflix was invented. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then from Joshua Statton, we have Hush is my absolute favorite story of Batman. The artwork, the dialogue, the villains, the twists, his relationship with Catwoman, everything is perfect. I really wish we could get a live action page for page movie of this story, it writes itself. And speaking of which, there actually was a live action animated movie, or not live action, but an animated movie um, (laughs) that they did earlier this year. Um, great casting, but they made some changes, and so I'd be interested to hear. Have you guys seen the movie, or I haven't? No, but so I'll just do this. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's something where it's like, whenever you're adapting something that's what was it, twelve issues long or something? Yeah, like it's twelve. Yeah. So that's a that's a lot of story. Yeah. And you know, sure, you can you can try and do a page for page adaptation. They did that with Watchmen 10 years ago, and there's a lot of opinions about how successful that actually was. Um, but I, you know, I, I think you, you almost have to make changes in order yeah. to, because this is a very dense story, and to try and, to try and do that dense of a story um, over the course of a two hour film, is an, that's an impossible ordeal. Like, you have to make changes somewhere. Is it two hours? The end? I'm assuming. Probably, yeah. I, I would think. Yeah. Well, well, some of the main changes that they made was, for example, Catwoman actually pushes Lois off the ledge when she's kind of dangling her there. That's interesting. It's uh, instead of, yeah. she kind of <laughs> sees that things aren't working out as planned and she kind of just throws her off rather than Lois fighting back yeah. and then falling. So what do you guys think of like changes like that? Because that can actually change kind of the character, I would think. That's that's a, yeah. that, that really that's does change. Because um, like, Changing the, even what's ostensibly like a very small moment like that, it reflects very differently on both Catwoman and on Lois. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's that's sort of interesting that they would do that. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. That's that's a weird one too. Like I mean, I I haven't seen the animated film, so mm-hmm. I can't really say what the context was. You know what I mean? Um, but um, but it, it, it's strange. You know, I, I feel like Hush works really well as a comic, and I think it's just there's some comics. I mean, Watchmen I think is one of them that this is the medium, yeah. you know, and you yeah. can't really translate it. You can take bits and pieces for influence, but I think it's hard to pull and go page for page. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. we're sitting here talking about it how many years later and, and pointing out maybe one or two flaws or weaknesses. Maybe they, they changed those. Maybe they had it's the true. same opinion yeah. and said, you know what, we can make this a little bit better. Yeah. Well, I know some of them had to do with, like, continuity of some of the other DC animated films, right. too. That's, so That's part of it. Um, like, I think Bane was switched out for Killer Croc, because Killer Croc yeah. had some stuff going on in um, uh, DC Sons of Batman. Yeah. So they so had to... get fixed? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I didn't see that one. But I think one of the biggest changes was Hush isn't Tommy. Yeah. So it, <gasps> Hush is Whoa. a new... Hush is a new identity assumed by the Riddler. So that's a huge, you know. That's a shift. Because Tommy's actually then killed by the Riddler, doesn't come back. So that really, I feel, almost changes the story entirely, but maybe for a better way. Well, that's, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's interesting, obviously. Um, 
I feel like, again, you have to sort of take the animated film in the context of the fact that like they have this whole separate film universe that they've been working on for years and years now, where it's like they come out with a new sort of entry, I don't know, every eight or nine months, something like that. Um, so yeah, to, to keep that sort of like contextual sort of frame here, you, you have to, it's, it's got its own canon basically. And so the canon of the animated film universe is not the same canon as the, the comics. True, yeah. so you have to make some changes. Yeah. Now, if you guys were to cast a movie for Batman Hush, who would you choose to play some of the title characters but wrong answers only? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll start just because there ben, you go. ben Affleck's had his day. It's Matt Damon's turn. <laughs> Put him in the cow. I don't even know that I would consider that that wrong of an answer. Because like, he's I, got the Jason Bourne going already. Yeah, like he's done the Bourne films. Right. Like he's done action before. He's a little older now. This is sort of an older, grizzlier mm. uh, bat, Batman. Yeah. So one I could make it a Batman. whole new movie and just have Ben Affleck as, as the Joker then. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So my, my film knowledge is super dated. So like anybody I name is going to be like out of date. But I mean, John how Wayne. About, yeah, well, hey, not that dated. <laughs> But I mean, like maybe Gilbert Godfrey as the Riddler. I mean, you know, like. <laughs> oh my God! I'm just picturing that'd be ridiculous, Leonardo. right? <laughs> Again, it's like, I, like if if that happened, I'm like, I don't think I'd even be mad. No, like, I think it'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like we're talking wrong answers, but I'm like, is, yeah, is it, is it that wrong? Is yeah, it, is that's it true. To, to hope for something. We like don't. That? We don't want Dorito Man in every. Uh, uh, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm just gonna go my, Batman, Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> We've, It'd we've be a got whole a different. <laughs> Michael Chiklis is Killer Croc. <laughs> the penguin becomes Batman. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, I think that's some funny answers. I, I think there'd be some great potential for some wrong movie casting. <laughs> that would be hilarious. All right. And so let's go on. Um, I kind of want to ask you guys, uh, what would you suggest for people to kind of read after reading Batman Hush, if they whether they want to continue reading Batman or if they want to try something else, but in that same spirit, do you guys have any um, recommendations? Yeah, I would say um, to continue directly off of Hush, if you really liked Hush and liked what Hush set up, you got to go read Under the Hood because mm. um, that's this Hush did a lot. You know, you you bring back Jason Todd. Um, who's actually Clayface in, in this story. Um, but then they, they leave it open. They're like, yeah. well, Jason Todd's body isn't in its grave anymore. So they, they set up the return of Jason proper, and that's what happens in Under the Hood. Um, I, I much prefer Under the Hood over Hush. <laughs> Is there a but scene where he fights three bears in that? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Jason's my favorite Robin. Um, I, I think Under the Hood is, is really compelling. Um, so if you, if you liked Hush and if you liked particularly the stuff about Jason Todd, you got to go read Under the Hood. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I think I'm going to have to check that one out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, you know comics. So. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Under the Hood, I think, is for, for a direct continuation, that is the best way to go. I mean, when they revealed Jason Todd in the comics, that in, in the trade when you're reading it, that's like the holy crap moment. You know what I mean? Um, well, it was an even bigger holy crap moment when it was being serialized because they yeah. reveal him and then the issue's over and then and you're you've done. Wait a month. Yeah, and like so, everybody who reads it, they're like, "This, this is cool." And like, under the hood is she's right. Like that is the best, you know. Um, and then if if you're if you're reading Hush, it's kind of like this is a graphic novel where it's like you've never read Batman before. Let's try this. Like people are usually like, "Where do I go next?" And usually, if it's not Batman, it's X Men. And I would I would recommend Astonishing X Men by Joss Whedon. Um, that's like the de facto starting point for X Men when I have somebody come in the store and they're like, "Where do I start with X Men?" Because just like Hush, it boils down the core of each character. It introduces each character in a way where it's kind of like boom, boom, boom. And I mean, that's that's where I would I would point people after Hush if they were looking for something not Batman related. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> My big one that I'd like to point out, I like I said, I'm not the biggest Batman reader, but Flashpoint Batman, I absolutely oh, yeah. loved. It's completely different, basically, you know, what would happen if the, the tables were turned and it was, you know, his parents that survived and Batman died. So really interesting premise there and I, I really like that it's a great what book. if kind of yeah. storyline yeah. going along with the movie thing. Yeah, it's a great book. So we're gonna Wrap things up here, but I wanted to go ahead and give you guys a moment to kind of 
talk a little bit about what you're working on and where people can kind of find out more about you and what you're doing? Cool. Um, you can find us at Third Eye Comics in Annapolis, Maryland. That's our flagship store. We also have locations in Richmond, Virginia, Lexington Park, Maryland, and online at thirdeyecomics.com. Nice. So, and I, I have it here with me today, The Overstreet Price Guide to Batman. Uh, this is my most recent book. Uh, I worked on this with uh, Amanda Sheriff. This came out in November. Um, it was Diamond's top selling book for November. So thank you very much to everyone who has supported this so far. And if you want to make it the top selling book of the month again, <laughs> head to your uh, friendly local comic shop. We carry and, it. <laughs> uh, and order this. So uh, yeah, if you're into Batman, uh, this is, I, I like to think of it as the uh, definitive book for Batman collecting. So. See, this is why we had you on, because you are the Batman girl. <laughs> Uh, if you want to check out a uh, amusing Batman original little jokey fan film I made, it's uh, on Funny's Funny on YouTube. Uh, that's Funny's with an apostrophe S. So that's all the time we have for this episode. I want to thank my panel of guests for joining me today. Thank you guys. And I want to thank you guys for joining us as well. Make sure if you liked hearing about Hush to go to your friendly local comic shop and pick up a copy of the comic. And if you don't know where your friendly local comic shop is, head to comicshoplocator.com and that'll help you find the one nearest to you. Also, I want to say if you guys have a comic that you'd like us to discuss, make sure to leave a comment um, below so that way we can figure out what our next month's selection will be. And lastly, I'm going to say, Heroes are a dime a dozen, but comic fans are priceless. So we'll see you guys here next time.